toolkits that you'll be receiving as you go through the 4D pathway. So in the discovery phase, it's just a basic set of information on what is the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative, what are the 10 steps of successful breastfeeding, what is the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes. We give you the self-appraisal tool, though that's also online, um, and we have a sample CEO support letter, so you don't have to write it. The real purpose of the CEO support letter is to making sure that the facility understands that this initiative is underway. Um, this is not just a project of lactation. This cannot be carried out by a sole person within the organization. It really is a facility-wide effort. And it's amazing how widespread you find the baby-friendly tentacles spreading within a facility. So, um, so that's kind of a primary purpose for that. In the development phase, um, the toolkit that we supply to you, first of all, is the guidelines and our evaluation criteria. They are also found online, and I'm going to do a little quiz show with you in just a few moments on our guidelines to see if any of you have had a chance to read them and what you already know about what's required. Um, we did, we do one of my favorite documents in the development phase toolkit is our model action plans. So we've gone through step by step. We've talked to baby friendly designated hospitals and said, what did you do to implement this step? What are some of the model actions you think you need to put in place to get each step? lined up, and we give those to you. You are welcome to use them. You may find some of those actions have already been implemented in your facility. You may find you have additional action steps you want to take, but you can use this model action plan sort of as a checkoff tool and um, indicate when you've accomplished something. You can use it to assign tasks in your multidisciplinary committee. I mean, we really see this as a nice organizational tool to help you kind of plan the work. Um, and so as you've worked on your action plans, then those will be um, reviewed and submitted, or those will be submitted to us, and we'll give you feedback on those. We also, in the development phase, give you a budget planner. How do you figure out what infant formula might cost? Um, and so we have some um, guidance for you on how to calculate fair market value. We have some guidance for you on how you might try to figure out how much infant formula you'll be using at your facility. Um, Ann already mentioned we have a policy development tool and a policy checkoff tool. So let me talk a little bit about both of those. The policy checkoff tool that we supply to you is the tool that the assessors will use to evaluate your infant feeding policy. So we think we're being very transparent in providing you with this tool. And let me just say, we want you to succeed. Baby Friendly is set up because we want you to succeed. We want to give the prize to you all. We will only give it when you've passed. Um, but we want you to pass. So the policy checkoff tool is designed to give you what we're looking for in the infant feeding policy. The policy development tool gives you sample language for what we mean by each point in the policy checkoff tool. You are invited to use that language if you would like. We don't consider it plagiarism. You may modify it if you want. It's given, we had a lot of folks say to us when we first came up with the policy checkoff tool, what do you mean by this and what do you mean by this? And we just thought it was just easier if we told you what we meant by each point. Um, there's other great tools that are out there that Anna already talked about. Um, we really believe these policies should be your policy. I've heard many, many times, why doesn't Baby Friendly just write a policy and give it to us and we'll just implement it? And you know if we did that, you'd hate it. You know we'd never come up with the right policy. You'd think we live in an ivory tower. You'd think, what are these people thinking? So we know we can't write the right policy for you. That's not appropriate for us. And really, how could we objectively assess the policy if we wrote it? Um, and then we'd be arguing about, well, we couldn't implement this the way you guys wrote it. So we believe policy is yours. We're going to assess your policy for compliance with our guidelines. So I just want to talk about that. The community survey. Um, I mentioned um, continuity of care, organizing a continuity of care committee. Um, and I think Ann talked a little bit about this in her remarks about um, prenatal education. Um, like who is providing the prenatal education to the women that are delivering in your facilities? Some of you are doing that prenatal education yourself. Some of you are, are, do not provide that services, but you need community partners to be delivering that information to you, to your patients, so that they are adequately prepared when they walk through your door. And I agree with Ian's comments around getting moms ready for the maternity care practices that you're going to have in place. You really want to work with your community, your community partners partners to find out what they're telling moms about breastfeeding, 
what they're telling moms about maternity care practices to support breastfeeding. Those community partners can be so valuable to helping to set up a proper stage for you all in, in the work that you're trying to do. So kind of thinking about the role of the community and how it impacts the 10 steps, um, it reminds me of a story that um, was told to us by one of our hospitals who said um, we, they were looking at their data and they saw on, on this one particular month there was a spike in exclusive breastfeeding rates. And they were really curious about what caused that spike. And so as they drilled down and, and reviewed the data, they narrowed it down to this one particular month that the, the month that the exclusive breastfeeding rate spiked um, was the peak of the swine flu epidemic. So what's the relationship between exclusive breastfeeding and swine flu? So this, this hospital put in, uh, just to, to stem the spread of swine flu, they put in restricted visiting hours. And what happened was nobody was visiting the moms. The moms and babies were in their rooms together. They were spending lots and lots and lots of skin-to-skin -skin time. The 10 steps got a chance to work. And this, this facility has become one of our best describers and advocates of how this, the interplay of the 10 steps all work uh, to promote what you're trying to accomplish. So why do I bring that up with the community survey is we really need to get the community on board with not taking the time that moms and babies are in the hospital uh, to come visit mom. The moms aren't there with you long enough. Save the block parties for when they come home. That time, that short period of time that moms are in the hospital with you all, with your expert care, they need time to rest up and they need time to get your coaching skills to help them be successful when they care for their babies when they get back home. So, um, so we, we provide a survey. You can use it. You can modify it. But the thought was that you would use that to survey community partners to find out what they're doing. See if you can bring them to the table for some discussions on how they can support your efforts. Um, we provide you with a patient education planning template. Uh, we provide you with information on staff training requirements. That's also in our guidelines and evaluation criteria. We give you a, a staff training template uh, to, to develop your staff training plan. We give you a documentation tool, although you may find that um, you have other tools that you want to use that are just as effective, and that's fine. We give you a data collection planning template and a PowerPoint presentation that you can use to describe what the BFHI is in your facility. We provide um, review and feedback um, on the various uh, plans and materials. Um, and then in the dissemination phase, I think Ann already mentioned that we provide the tools that we provide to you are um, audit tools to allow you to evaluate your practices um, and see whether or not that you are achieving the results that you are attempting to achieve. The audit tools are a series of mother interviews and staff interviews. Um, there's some data collection tools as well, um, but use those to practice for the on-site assessment and use them to find out what your staff and your patients are learning so that you can make the changes before we come out there. So again, another story about an audit tool. I was presenting on this in California a, a couple a couple of months ago, and one of the uh, folks in the audience said, I've been working with your audit tools, and I gotta tell you, the step three audit tool doesn't work. And I said, ooh, tell me more about that. Ooh, that's not good. So she said, well, I'm the one that provides prenatal education. And I was interviewing mothers, and they said they never got the information. So they're wrong. The tool doesn't work. And I said, well, that's really one possible answer. And I'm, I'm a big fan of critical thinking skills. And for any of you that have studied critical thinking skills, you know you examine a problem from multiple perspectives. So that was one valid perspective. I said, can we think of other valid perspectives? And so um, we ultimately talked about it. And, and here's what I would say you might think about doing with these tools. You know, at the end of the interview, if, you'd not, if you're getting results that don't make sense to you, you might stop and say, you know what? I provided this brochure to you, or I sat down with you at this point in time. What did that mean for you? You know, that's a chance. Here this person honestly believes she delivered that education, and the moms were honestly saying to her, I didn't get it. So what I would say is that the information wasn't delivered in a way that was meaningful for those mothers. And that's important information for you to have. That's not that you failed. That's not that you're awful. You did your best. But if you're finding it's not working for moms, then there's an opportunity to do it better. And so that's what we see the audit tool is all about. 
Again, in the designation phase, um, the tools that we provide are um, participation in a readiness assessment telephone interview where we talk about where do you think you are with the implementation of the 10 steps. Um, we encourage you to work with your uh, purchasing department to purchase the, um, the breast milk substitutes. Um, and then we spend a lot of time with you helping you get ready for the on-site assessment. So to attain designation, you implement the 10 steps. You invite a survey team from our office to come. You undergo a survey. Um, the team creates a report. Um, that report gets blinded and submitted to an external review board. Um, this external review board is made up of well-known maternal and child health experts from around the country. They don't know who you are, and we never tell them tell you who they are. Um, but they review the report and make sure that the assessment findings are accurate, and um, they're the ones that confer designation. Usually we're able to turn reports around in six to eight weeks. Every so often we get a big surge of uh, assessments all at one time. I'm really really worried about the day we do the NICHQ 90s um, and what the backlog that might be. Um, but, um, but anyway, we, we, we try to turn the assessment reports around pretty quickly. So this, this slide is just to remind you, if you don't hear from us enough, um, your most important document to guide you through your baby-friendly journey is our guidelines and evaluation criteria. Um, so I just want you to know I worked really hard to make those pictures come in in step order. Um, so, but that's what the guidelines and evaluation criteria look like. Um, and so, oh, excuse me, let me just talk a little bit about that. One of the things that we hear feedback on um, quite a bit is um, the guideline says one thing and the evaluation criteria says something else. So, an ex so the guidelines will say all mothers will, should get A, B, and C kind of care. And then the evaluation criteria will say 80% must report. And we get emails all the time that say, well, which is it? Do they all have to do it or is 80%? So let me just explain. We see the guideline as setting the standard of care for all moms and all babies. But the criteria for evaluation is the minimum passing grade for achieving baby-friendly designation. So when we say all moms, we really mean all moms should get that a certain kind of care. And we're encouraging you to strive to achieve that care for all moms. We do understand that there are circumstances where that might not occur, and there is a threshold and a tolerance, and so you can pass baby-friendly assessment even if all moms don't get something. Um, and I think, as Anne pointed out, always remember documentation is your best friend. Um, the baby-friendly assessment isn't typically about uh, chart audits, but we go, to recon we go to the chart to reconcile discrepancies between what moms report and what you've told us the standard of care is in your facility. So that's really important. So I put together a little game. Um, hopefully you'll be able to play or, or just if you haven't read our guidelines and evaluation criteria, um, at least you can take some guesses and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, each of the answers. So um, do the nursing staff, according to our guidelines, do the nursing staff in the NICU require training in all 15 lessons? <laughs> Any thoughts on that? Yes. Okay. So I've heard a yes. So here, so sorry, I, there's an obnoxious clapping. I don't know how to turn it off on the slide without. So, um, always go back to your guidelines and evaluation criteria to see what we say. So, the guidelines and evaluation criteria on um, page eight says training for nursing staff on maternity should comprise of a total of 20 hours and inclusive of the 15 lessons identified by. UNICEF and WHO plus five hours of supervised clinical experience. So let me just clarify this language here because it's 15 lessons. The 20 hours, it's, it's somewhat envisioned that the 20 hours, of the, each of the lessons take about fifth, an hour lesson and plus the, fifth, the um, five hours of clinical competency. It's not 25 hours, it's 20. Um, so... The, the, the next point is the facility should determine the amount and content of training required by staff and other units and the roles by their anticipated workplace exposure to mothers and babies. So the, the answer is 
the more pe- the more folks in the facility are trained, the better. And I think you have to evaluate your relationship between the um, the the, the regular mother baby unit and then NICU and how the babies are going back and forth and determine the appropriate amount of training for NICU staff based on that relationship. Um, the other piece is that, um, that, that sometimes you rotate staffing from around different departments and if that's the case, anybody that's working on the normal mother baby unit has to have those, those 15 hours of lessons. So baby friendly is not at this time in the United States about assessing the NICU. We are talking about adopting the NICU, um, component as well. Um, we will be working with our international colleagues and p- also putting a team together here in the United States. Um, but we have a big challenge around uh, the normal mother-baby care here in this country right now, and that's where we, we're putting our greatest energy. So we're not assessing the NICU um, at this time. But I just want to also just talk a little bit about our guidelines and evaluation criteria. Um, there, there are wide variations in facility structures and operations. The guidelines can't address every facility's very specific set of circumstances. So we really have to ask you to evaluate your circumstances in the context of the guidelines, they're not going to drill down and tell you how exactly uh, it's going to work for your facility. And so there will be times we'll have some discussions around that. Um, so again, if, if NICU staff are being rotated to the normal um, uh, newborn floor, then they should have, um, they must have all 15 lessons. They should have them anyway. So here's another question. This comes up a lot. Do we have to train all staff, including housekeeping? Okay, good answer. So, and again, I would just um, go back to the same section of the guidelines and evaluation criteria where the facility should determine the amount and content of training required by staff and other units and their roles by their anticipated workplace exposure uh, to the mother. So let me just move on so I can move us through this presentation quickly. But essentially, um, all staff who have contact with mothers and babies should have a basic understanding of the importance of exclusive breastfeeding, know their role in supporting breastfeeding, um, minimally feel comfortable witnessing some of the practices that support exclusive breastfeeding, and know who to call if a mother is a question with a problem with breastfeeding. So you certainly don't want a mother, you don't want a housekeeping staff member to walk into an office and see a mother, or excuse me, walk into a patient room and see a mother and baby skin to skin and go, ooh, what's that? Um, oh, that's gross, cover up. You know, you really want staff comfortable with that. So we don't expect you to spend hours and hours and hours uh, training your staff but training your housekeeping staff. But they should be comfortable. They should know exclusive breast milk feeding is the norm in your facility, and that's an important way for babies to be fed, and this is the care we provide. So may we accept training that meets the BFHI requirements that occurred prior to employment? Yes. So, um, and um, if training is acquired prior to employment with the facility, um, you just should verify the competencies. so our, in the development phase training plan, we, I told you we give you a little doc, uh, template, and that template asks you to talk about how you're going to, what are you going to accept, and how are you going to know that the training occurred, and how are you going to verify the competencies. So what topics should be covered in prenatal education? Breastfeeding. <laughs> Good answer. Okay, skin to skin. Pacifier use. Okay, so, and I'm just going to move through these quickly because I'm taking a bit of time, but the guidelines say that the education should cover the importance of exclusive breastfeeding, basic breastfeeding management, including the importance of early skin-to-skin contact, early initiation of breastfeeding, rooming in, baby-led feeding. So these are all in the guidelines and evaluation criteria. You don't need to take these all down. Just wanted you to see them. What's the definition of skin-to-skin? I know. It's skin to skin. I just heard that. <laughs> so let me pop that up because um, you, um, you know something? It's not, ooh. It, um, oops. Sorry, that's the next question. I don't know why the answer didn't come up. It may, I, I may really have disabled this answer button. 
Okay. On page 30 of our guidelines and evaluation criteria, there is an exam, there is a definition of skin to skin. And the reason we've gotten so explicit in providing with the definition, and in fact, you'll see in a policy checkoff tool that we expect that you include a definition of skin to skin in the, um, in your policy, because we've seen it cheek to cheek. We've seen it. Baby's wrapped up on mother's naked chest. Mother gets to be on the baby's naked mom dressed. Um, we've seen a whole variety of skin to skin. So we want to be really clear what, what we mean by skin to skin. So, um, and then uh, which mothers and babies need to be placed skin to skin? All mothers, yeah. Okay. Um, what step requires staff to teach hand expression to mothers? Thank you for setting me up for that one, Ann. Step six, exclusive breastfeeding. I believe it's step five, which is show all mothers how to breastfeed and how to maintain lactation should they be separated. Um, which mothers and babies should be rooming in during their post? Oh, great. I'll move us through. Which mothers need to be taught um, baby feeding cues? Oh, great. Can a baby-friendly hospital provide pacifiers to their patients? Yes, so we know during the painful procedures... Um, and for NICU babies, um, great. What kinds of breastfeeding support information should be shared with um, breastfeeding women? When the, and when should this information be shared? Okay. So we talk a lot about this in step 10. I, I think it's early and often. You can never give enough information um, about how women can get support. I also am going to just throw out there to think about how you frame this. Um, I'm a pretty strong-willed person, and I'm kind of like, I pride myself on being able to take care of myself. I hate it when I need support. Um, and I think a lot of women don't like to go to support groups, you know, but um, I think Ann talked about baby cafes, uh, mother's groups. You may want to think about how you name some of what you're doing, because uh, I think it does impact how many moms will want to participate. So here's your challenge. It's to review the guidelines and evaluation criteria, consider your particular circumstances and how you will implement them in the context of your resources, your staffing, your physical plant, and your circumstances. So I'll just take, do I still have time back in my running? Just really quickly. So let me just quickly run through the last slides. Um, we, the 4D pathway um, was designed to help you succeed. It was designed to correct some of the challenges that we had uh, in the Certificate of Intent program. So, you know, to help bring full facil facility support onto the project, not just have this being viewed as a lactation project, we've put some requirements in in the 4D pathway. The purpose of the letter of support, the multidisciplinary committee, the creation of the team to review your self-appraisal tool and implement and develop work plans. Um, the infant feeding policy, um, we often found in the old Certificate of Intent program, things weren't uh, comprehensive, the policy wasn't driving the practice, and we put a number of things in place in the 4D pathway there uh, to help you um, to help you succeed with staff education. We've, um, excuse me, to, to help you succeed with, um, with, with your infant feeding policy. We also found um, that when we were going to facilities, people often attempt staff training as one of the first challenges of baby friendly. And it's a concrete task. Everybody thinks it makes sense to get everybody trained all up front. Um, people plan for the initial training, but not subsequent training. So when there's turnover in staff, after that big push to get everybody trained, there haven't been plans to keep people trained and keep, keep um, making sure all your staff are on board, which is why we put in all of the training plan requirements and um, giving you the audit tools to evaluate where you are with that. Same thing with patient education plans. We found that patients were, it was, patient education was haphazard. Plans weren't written down. There weren't policies and procedures in place. And so hence the 4D pathway came up with a whole series of tools and protocols to help you do that. Um, we also found that facilities weren't using our guidelines and evaluation criteria to evaluate their practices. They weren't auditing practices before we came out, and hence the audit tools. So I think I'll stop with that. Um, we have a redesignation process. We'll talk about that at another time. So good. Thank you all.
and I know y'all have um, questions for Trish, so she'll certainly be here until about 2.30 today, and then she's got a flight out. So um, so we're going to um, move on to our next speaker um, to try to get us a little bit back on track.